Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you uh, another episode of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. If you have any comments, send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote over at Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And if you haven't filled out our listener survey, please do so at survey.greatdetectives.net. Got a couple comments from Zachariah. He enjoyed uh, the Christmas episode. This is the best episode ever of Old Time Radio for Christmas time. Uh, and he also writes, I just saw the new Sherlock Holmes movie. It was a very enjoyable movie, although it didn't really feel like Holmes to me. It felt more like the guy from Numbers with a really tough edge. And he says that he enjoys these episodes that I'm playing, and he did enjoy this movie. Um, well, thanks. I think I will see the Sherlock Holmes movie, but I'm leaning towards it more being um, uh, an, um, in my Netflix queue uh, as opposed to going to the theater. I just I just don't go to the theater that often, but um, I, I've heard a lot. It, it'll be interesting to see just so I can have my own um, opinion rather than just kind of the varying and uh, conflicted uh, opinions, though mostly positive, but mostly agreeing that it wasn't quite Holmes. You know, speaking of that, uh, I got a little curious, because um, one name you you hear on every Sherlock Holmes episode, and you might just skip over it, is the name Edith Miser. Uh, and I was kind of wondering, well, who is Edith uh, Miser as a writer? Uh, she actually wrote uh, all of the Rathbone uh, Bruce episodes, and then uh, and going back, she actually started um, uh, with Holmes on the radio in 1930. She wrote the first script um, for uh, William Gillette's appearance on the uh, radio series that uh, uh, we played earlier with Richard Gordon. Uh, Miser basically was she, she was an actress, um, had a lot of success on Broadway, and then uh, you know, but she was a big time Sherlock Holmes fan, and she actually went to start lobbying networks to start dooming um, Sherlock Holmes, um, and uh, she got them to uh, um, uh, she got she got them to. Uh, go ahead and put it on the air, and she handled uh, the ad the adaptations. Uh, and she basically just steadfastly, she said she wasn't going to add any extra violence or sex to appeal uh, to the audience. Um, uh, she was just going to tell the stories in the in the spirit of Arthur Conan Doyle, and even the stories that she wrote that departed uh, from the Holmes canon. Those were praised by the Arthur Conan Doyle family. Now, of course, when we're talking about the Conan Doyle family, you know, this was back in a time when he had close relatives still alive. Uh, but basically, it's through her work that Holmes was able to get on the air um, and that it, she, it was able to stay on the air for so many years. And she got to adapt um, her favorite stories uh, to the uh, to the air. So a very uh, neat and determined uh, lady, uh, and I just thought I just thought that'd be an interesting tidbit to share. All right, well we're going to get into today's show in just a moment. Before we do, uh, I want to encourage you as you make travel plans for the new year. Remember this name. Uh, JohnnyDollarAir.com. JohnnyDollarAir.com will take you to Priceline.com, where you have the option to name your price on hotels, airline tickets, um, rental cars, or to search for public uh, published specials like you do on any other site. Uh, if you go to JohnnyDollarAir.com, you get the great deals that come with Priceline, plus uh, uh, your uh, your purchase helps to support great old time radio. So please go to johnnydollarair.com. Uh, we're going to get into today's episode, The Copper Beaches, 
here on the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. <laughs> Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The makers of Bromo Quinine Cold Tablets bring you another adventure of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. This program is presented every week at this same time, and a complete story is dramatized each time. Colds are already here, ladies and gentlemen. Be on your guard. Be careful. The so-called common cold may be the start of more serious illness. At the first sign of a cold, take famous bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets act promptly and decisively to relieve the discomforts of a cold. They help reduce the fever of a cold. They give you the results you want in the time you want. Yes, at the very first sign of a cold, let it be bromoquinine cold tablet. Now here we are once more in the cheerful, firelit study of the famous Dr. Watson, who's relating his delightful Sherlock Holmes adventure. Good evening, Doctor. You look a bit irritated, if you'll pardon my saying. Good evening, Mr. Manning. Good evening. Yes, I am a bit annoyed, and with good reason. I don't know if I've told you that Holmes has been listening in to these reminiscences. Well, here's a letter I received from him after last week's story. Read it. All right. My dear Watson, I noticed that in your last broadcast, you gave way to your regrettable habit of emotionalizing your story. Detection, my dear fellow, is or ought to be an exact science. To tinge it with romanticism is like introducing a love story into the fifth proposition of Euclid. As ever, Sherlock Holmes. Well, what do you think of that? But the emotion was there. You couldn't tamper with the truth. Holmes has always maintained that the truth is not in what you say, but in the impression you create in the other person's mind. <laughs> well, Holmes always complained that I overstress the, uh, the human element in recording his cases. How well I remember the attitude with which he received the publishing of my first book about his adventure. It was a cold morning... In early spring, we were sitting on either side of a cherry fire in our rooms in vacancy. A thick fog rolled down between the dun-colored houses. Our gas was lit. It shone on the white cloth and glimmered on the coffee cups and on the silver. The breakfast table had not yet been cleared away. Holmes had been silent all the morning, smoking his long cherrywood pipe, which usually displaced his favorite clay when he was in a disputatious mood. Altogether, he was not in the best of tempers. Matches, matches. Where are the matches? Look at that confounded fog. What happens to all the matches in this house, I'd like to know. My dear Holmes, why not use the tongs and a live coal if you want to relight your pipe? Huh? Ow! I burned myself. Ah. For heaven's what sake, the... Holmes, stop oh. sobbing. Something's annoying you. Why not get it off your chest? It's that confounded book of yours. What? Sensationalism, Watson. Rank sensationalism. You're always placing the emphasis on the crime. Crime is common. Logic is rare. You should stress the logic. You have degraded what should have been a course of lectures into a series of tales. Now, really, Holmes, that's not logical. You're always complaining that crime is falling off. You say there are no first-class criminals left. Quite. And therefore, if you depend on the crime to hold your readers, you will soon be a back number. Criminals. Bah! They've lost all their enterprise and originality. My practice seems to be to generating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving good advice to young ladies from boarding schools. <laughs> advice to the love law, eh? <laughs> well, look at this. This note. It came by the board this morning's post. Here. The last straw. That's what it is. Read it. Really, let's have a look. Dear Mr. Holmes, I'm very anxious to consult you as to whether I should or I should not accept a situation which has been offered me as a governess. <laughs> I shall call at half past ten tomorrow if I do not inconvenience you. Yours faithfully, Violet Hunter. Well, it's, it's almost eleven now. Exactly. She's late. Just like a woman. Uh, I say, Holmes, this must be your young lady now, walking briskly up the street. See. Si. Hmm. Brisk, purposeful manner. Nice, bright, intelligent face. Yes, it is. She, she's stopping at our door. Well, there may be something in this case after all, my dear Watson. 
is not the uh, hysterical sort that makes a fuss over nothing. Here she is. Come in. How do you do? This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Quite. And um, this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? I trust you'll excuse my troubling you, Mr. Holmes, but I've had a very strange experience... And as I have no relations of any sort to advise me, I thought I'd best come to you. I shall be very happy to do anything that I can. Well, I, I, I've i been a governess for five years in the family of Colonel Spence Monroe. He's been transferred to Nova Scotia so that for the last few months I've been without a situation. Why, well, I, I advertised and answered advertisements, but without success. You see, the money I had saved began to run out, and I was at my wit's end. Indeed, indeed. Well, go on. Well... Yesterday, I called in at a well-known employment agency run by a Miss Stouffer. When I arrived, the outer office was filled with young ladies looking for situations. I, I was told to wait. But I did so, and after about half an hour, my name was called out. Well, the door to Miss Stouffer's private office was ajar. Seated beside her was a prodigiously stout man with a round, smiling face and a heavy chin. Oh, his, his eyes were like two little slits. Well, I advanced to the door, my knees trembling. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you know how I needed that work. Come in, my dear. Come in. Mr. Rucastle. This is Miss... Uh, oh, what is your name, my dear? Uh, Miss Hunter. Violet Hunter. Oh, yes. Miss Hunter. Oh, capital, capital. I couldn't ask for anything better... I'm sure you'll do, Miss Hunter. Well, I, I hope so, Mr. Rucastle. You're looking for a situation as a governess? Yes, sir. And, and what, do you, what salary do you ask? Well, I, I had four pounds a month in my last place. Four pounds? Sweating. Rank sweating. How anyone could have the audacity to offer that to a lady with such attraction, such accomplishments. A lady fitted for the rearing of a child who may someday play a considerable part in the history of this country. Oh, your salary, believe me, madam, would commence at 100 pounds a year. A hundred... Oh, Mr. Rucastle, no, I... Furthermore, it is my custom to advance my young ladies half their salary beforehand. May, may I ask where you live, Mr. Rucastle? Hampshire, the charming rural spot. Oh. The Copper Beaches is the name of the place five miles north of Winchester. Oh, the dearest old house. And, and what would be my duty? One child, a dear little romper, age six. Oh, if you could see him killing cockroaches with a slipper. Smack, smack. He's gone before you could wink. <laughs> my yeah, my yeah. sole duty, then, is to take care of this this child. Well, I, I, I'm sure your good sense would suggest that you obey any little commands which my wife might give, provided, of course, that they were such as a lady might obey with propriety. Uh, you see no difficulty, eh? Oh, I should be happy to make myself useful. Oh, by the way, in dress, for example, we're fatty people. Fatty but kind-hearted. Now, now, if you were asked to wear a particular dress that we might give you, 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 you wouldn't object to our little whim. Oh, no. <laughs> or oh, to sit here or there, that wouldn't be offensive to you. Well... Why, no. no. Or to cut your hair short before you come to them. My, my hair? Oh, yes, it is quite essential. It's a little fancy of my wife, you see. And ladies' fancies, my dear Miss Hunter, must be consulted. But my, <laughs> my, my hair. Oh, no, I know I, I couldn't. No, oh, oh, what a pity. Well, in that case, Miss Stoper, I'd best infect a few more of your young ladies. Good day, then, Miss Hunter. I'm afraid you must consider yourself struck from our list. Oh, but I... You can hardly expect us to exert ourselves to find another such opening for you. But, Miss Stouffer... Good day, Miss Hunter. Oh, oh, just a minute, Miss Stouffer. Uh, let's not be too hard on the young lady. After all, my request was a little sudden. Uh, perhaps, Miss Hunter, you'd like 24 hours in which to consider the matter. Uh, and in view of the fact that you have particularly beautiful hair, I, I might be willing to raise the salary to 120 pounds a year uh, to recompense you for our little eccentricity. Yes. <laughs> Come in, Miss Hunter. Unusual, most unusual, my dear Miss Hunter. Uh, what do you make of it, Watson? Well, perhaps the gentleman's wife is a lunatic, and he wishes to humor her offenses in order to prevent an outbreak. Possibly, Watson. Possibly. In any case, it doesn't seem a nice household for a young lady. But the money, Mr. Holmes. The money, and I need it so. Well, yes. The pay is good. Too good. Why should they give you 120 pounds when they can have their pick for 40? There must be some strong reason. But uh, I have no choice. Then uh, you've made up your mind to accept? Yes, I must. I thought if I told you the circumstances, you would understand afterwards if I wanted your help. 
Mr. Holmes, I should feel so much stronger if I knew you were behind me. Uh, certainly you may carry that feeling away with you. And if at any time you should find yourself in danger... Danger? Well, what danger could there be? My dear Miss Hunter, it would cease to be a danger if we could define it. But remember, at any time, day or night, just telegraph me and we'll come to your help. Oh, oh, course, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Charming Miss Hunter called. Conditions must be pretty good at the Copper Beaches, or, or we'd have heard from her. You never know, Watson. You never know. She may not be able to get to a telegraph office. Huh? Nonsense, though. Nothing very dreadful can happen out in the open country like that. Now, that's where you're wrong, Watson. It's my experience that the vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling, beautiful countryside. Oh, do you give me the creeps? What do you mean? The pressure of public opinion is greatest in the towns. There is no lane so vile that the scream of a tortured child or the thud of a drunkard's blow does not beget sympathy and assistance from the neighbors. But the countryside, my dear Watson, filled with its lonely houses, think of the hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness. Why, it may go on year in, year out in such places, and no one the wiser. Had our young friend gone to Winchester, I should not have had this uh, fear for her safety. It's the five miles of country which makes the danger. Uh, see what that is, Watson. Oh, thank you, sir. It's a telegram for you, huh? Oh, give it to me. It's from Miss Hunter. Oh, well, what's she say? Come at once. We'll meet you at the Black Swan Hotel, Winchester, at three this afternoon. And at my wits end, don't fail me. What do you suppose has happened? Hurry, Watson. We've no time to lose. There's a train from Waterloo Station in half an hour. If we can only get to her in time. In just a moment, we will follow Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson on their strange journey. Ladies and gentlemen, be careful of the so-called common cold. It may quickly turn into something else. Act quickly. Act prudently. At the first sign of a cold, take bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets promptly relieve the distress of a cold. They help reduce the fever of a cold. Bromoquinine tablets are effective for two very good reasons. First, they're made especially for the relief of a cold symptom. Specialized medication, in other words. Second, they work internally. They get out of cold discomforts from the inside, which is the way you want be businesslike in your treatment of a cold mystery. Take a businesslike preparation. Bromo quinine tablet. You can get these famous tablets at any drugstore in America, a few cents a box. Be sure you ask for Bromo, B R O M O, quinine, Q U I N I N E. Bromo quinine cold tablet. <laughs> Yes, there's the black swan. Opposite the station. Yes, and if I'm not mistaken, that's Mrs. Uh, that is Miss Hunter waiting for us on the doorstep. She looks a bit pale and, and shaky, eh, Holmes? Yes. Poor girl is obviously frightened. Mr. Holmes, so kind of you to come. You too, Dr. Watson. Oh, not at all. I can't oh. tell you. I can't tell you how anxious I'd be. There, there, there. There now, Miss Hunter. Perhaps if we go inside, they can give us a private sitting room. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I've ordered tea this way, too. Ah, yes, that's better. Nice, cozy fire. Uh, close the door, will you, Watson? Oh, sure. That's right. Now then, suppose we let the doctor do the pouring while you tell the story. First of all, uh, how do you like your tea? Uh, two lumps and a little cream. Oh, right, well. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Yes, and uh, now? Well, well, first of all, I've had no, no actual ill treatment from Mr. and Mrs. Newcastle, but I think things that frighten me... However, I had that begin at the beginning. Yes, that is generally a good place to start. Well, Mr. Holmes, Copper Beaches is a large, sinister looking house, almost completely surrounded by woods. It, it depressed me from the moment of my arrival. I was met at the door by Mr. Rucastle and his wife. And, uh, is she. No, Mr. Holmes. 
She's not mad. I see. She's a small, pale-faced woman, much younger than Mr. Rucastle. In fact, I gather that she's his second wife. You see, there was a daughter by the first marriage, a girl now over 20, but she's not living at the house. Mr. Rucastle said that she couldn't get along with her stepmother, so he sent her to America, to Philadelphia. Yes, so and does Mrs. Rucastle strike you as a difficult woman to get along with? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. Well, she's shy and rather quiet. More than once I surprised her in tears. At first, I thought it might be worry over the disposition of her child. Oh, what's the matter with his disposition? Well, he, he's badly spoiled. He has an ungovernable temper and seems to take great delight in torturing birds and small animals. Oh, pleasant little beast. And the rest of the household? Well, there's only one servant. Taller is his name. A rough, uncouth man with a perpetual smell of drink about him. Why to keep him, I don't know. Except, perhaps, because he's the only one who can manage Carlo. Carlo? Yes. Carlo's a huge, underfed mastiff that's kept chained in the stable during the day, but at night they let him out. Oh, it's a terrible beast. Even Mr. Rucastle is afraid of him. I'm sure he'd tear any trust if it a bit. Hmm. I wonder why Mr. Rucastle desires such ferocious protection. I'm sure I don't know unless... Unless there's something on the top floor of the West Wing that he wants to protect. The West Wing, eh? Yes, the door that leads into it is opposite my room and it's kept securely locked. Well, it looks nasty to me, huh? Uh, please, Watson, please. Don't interrupt. Well, the second day after my arrival, immediately after breakfast, Mr. Rucastle asked me to put on a dress which had been laid out for me on my bed. Uh, what was it like? Well, it wasn't a new dress, Mr. Holmes, but the material was excellent and of a particularly brilliant shade, an electric blue. Oh, electric blue, charming color. I put it on and went down to the living room. Mr. Lucas had placed a chair for me by the front window. He asked me to sit there with my back to the window and to read to him from a French novel. Well, I read for an hour, and at the end of that time, he said I might go upstairs and change. Hmm, strange. And this experience has been repeated every morning since then. Well, as time passed, I became more and more curious. Why were they so careful to keep my face turned away from the window? Naturally, I was consumed with the desire to see what was going on behind my back. So today I devised a means. I noticed at breakfast that Mr. Rucastle had had quite a few drinks. A happy thought seized me. My hand mirror had been broken, so I concealed a piece of it in my handkerchief and later in my book, feeling sure that Mr. Rucastle was too drunk to notice Holding the book up, I was able to see everything behind me. And what did you see? Well, at first there was nothing. At the second glance, however, I saw a young man in a gray suit leaning against a railing which bordered our field. He was looking earnestly in my direction. Mr. Rucastle must have noticed my surprise, for he burst out angrily. <laughs> Miss Hunter, your attention must be wandering. That's the second time that you've read that passage. Oh. Furthermore, there's an impertinent fellow up the road who keeps staring at you. Is he a friend of yours? Oh, no, Mr. Rucastle. I don't know anyone around here. Well, can you turn around and motion him to go away? Oh, wouldn't it be better not to notice him? Do what I tell you. I really don't encourage you to have any followers. Very well, Mr. Rucastle. There. Impertinent fellow. That will be all for this morning, Miss Hunter. You may go to your room. Oh, but Mr. Rucastle, I hope you don't. Go to your room, I say. Yes, sir. And after this, you needn't bother to wear that blue dress. Oh, dear, what a frightful household. Oh, if I could only get away from here, it's all so depressing. What? But he's left the key in the door to the west wing. He must be gone. I wonder what's inside. Oh, it, it wouldn't hurt to take just one look. Oh, how dark it is and empty. Wait. There's three doors. Where the middle one is barred at the end of an old iron bed, there. I wonder why. Oh, but it's spooky in here. What was that? Oh, I must have been a bat. Someone's in there. Or maybe it's something. I can't stand it. Too eerie. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out. Oh, dear, there comes Mr. Rucastle up the stairs. Oh, Mr. Rucastle. 
Mr. Rogers. Yes, it was you, then. I thought it must be when I saw the door open. Oh, I'm so frightened. Oh, my dear young lady, and what frightened you? Well, I was foolish enough to go into that vacant wing, but it was so lonely and eerie, and, and a bat swooped down into my face. Is that all? Well, what else could there be? And why do you suppose that I keep that door locked? I'm sure I don't know. It's to keep people out who have no business there, you see. I'm sure if I'd known it. Well, you know now, my dear young lady. And if you ever put your foot over that threshold again, I'll throw you to the back. <laughs> Dreadful experience. Mr. Holmes, I feel sure there's someone lost in that room. Someone who's unhappy, perhaps tortured. Oh, good heavens, it's almost five. I promised to be back by six. Mr. and Mrs. Newcastle are going out. If Mr. Newcastle should discover where I've been... You've acted like a brave and sensible girl, Miss Hunter. Yes, indeed you have. Do you think you could do one more thing? I can try, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson and I will be at the Copper Beaches by seven. The Newcastles will be gone by that time, and I don't imagine the Mastiff will be let loose until they return. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. It would be too dangerous for them to get back to the house. Good. We will hope that Tola is still drunk. At any rate, you must get us into the house. We must explore the West Wing. I'll do my best, Mr. Holmes. Now I must hurry. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. Well, my dear Holmes, what do you make of it all? The blue dress and the man in front of the house. Obviously, they've had someone, uh, had her impersonating someone. Someone young whose hair has been cut off during an illness. That someone is probably the person imprisoned in the West Wing. Sinister. That is not the most sinister part of Miss Hunter's story. Oh, what is that? The unpleasant disposition of the child. Well, what's that got to do with it? My dear Watson, as a medical man, you know that a child's tendencies can be discovered by a study of the parents. But heredity as a science could be worked backwards as well. You can get a good insight into the character of the parents by studying the children. This child is cruel, abnormally cruel. He's probably inherited from one of his parents. I only hope nothing serious happens before 7 o'clock tonight. Gracious, what a night. First thunderstorm of the season. Ugly temper. Listen to the house with this group of copper beaches in front of it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Miss Hunter waiting for us in the doorway. The coast must be clear. Oh, come in, come in. You must be soaked to the skin. Oh, you're rather wet you're yourself. You, you must be careful, you know. You, you'll be quiet, catching what's the park. What's that pounding? It's Tola. He was just going out to release the dog. I sent him to the wine cellar, then locked him in. Splendid. I managed to get Tola's keys this afternoon, too. He was quite drunk. They are duplicates of Mr. Rukas. Better and better, but come along upstairs. We've no time to waste. Have you got your revolver handy, Watson? Yes. Good. Good heavens, uh, that lightning must have hit quite near here. Well, the copper beaches, no doubt. Now, which key? Oh, this one. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, nothing here. Come along. Listen to that rain on the roof. The middle door, you said. Hello in there. No answer. I don't like that. Watson, help me remove this bedstead, will you? Sure. That's right. All right, hide it, one side. Yeah, cut the rope. Yeah, That's it. The door's locked. Oh, we must break it open then. Come on. One, two, three. Hello. There's no one here. That villain Rucastle has made away with the prisoner. Maybe you're right. He's probably being carried off. Yes, but how? Through the skylight. It's still open. Shut that table over here. What are you going to do? Stand on it, of course. Yes, yes. Two pairs of footprints and the ladder resting against the eaves. So that's how he did it. But that's not possible. The ladder wasn't there when the blue castles went away. Then he must have come back. He's a dangerous and clever man. Listen. Yes. I think I hear his steps on the stairs. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you'll kill us all. I thought I'd find you here. Oh, villain, what have you done with your daughter? I, I'm the one that's asked that. You thieves, you robbers. I've caught you. You're in my power. I'll fix you. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'll fix you. He's going to get the dog. We'll be torn to shreds. Quick, Watson. We must close the front door. Right, Joe. Let me up. Let me up, Mr. Rukas. Loose the door. He's killed me, Mr. Rukas. Oh, quick, quick, quick. It'll be too late. Hold on. Get up the keys, Miss Hunter. Let him out. All right. 
Until uh, uh, bring Rukas into the house, will you? Oh, I feel so strange, weak. I can't stop crying. No, 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 no. Please, please, it's all over. <laughs> Just you go upstairs and pack your bag. Doctor Watson and I are going to take you back to town with us on the nine o'clock train. <laughs> think, Watson, that uh, Rue Castle will live? I'm afraid so, Holmes. Oh, I'm so glad to get away from that dreadful place. I say, Holmes, just what did happen to the prisoner in the West Wing, and who was it? It's all so disgusting, this simple, my dear Watson. It's Rue Castle's daughter, as I suspected. It seems that she had inherited some money from her mother, who was Rue Castle's first wife. When she threatened to get married and take a small fortune with her, her father tried to get her to sign a paper, giving the money to him. He worried her until she got brain fever and had to have all her hair cut off. Oh, what a, what a brute. I got all these details from Tiller. Still, her young man stuck to her and she to him. After that, Mr. Lucas locked his daughter up and brought Miss Hunter down from London in order to impersonate her, get rid of the persistent suitor. This young gentleman, however, was a persevering chap, and having greased Tola's palm very thoroughly, he learned the true state of affairs. And with the help of Tola and a long stepladder, he rescued his fiancée. They are now headed for Southampton with a special license, and this time Miss Woolcastle, or rather Mrs. Fowler, is really going to America on our honeymoon. Oh, this is uh, quite romantic, isn't it, Holmes? Ah, you and your romance, Watson. You're a regular old woman. Well, I'm glad we were able to help the poor thing, but I wouldn't go back to that house again. Not for twice the salary. Oh, um, that reminds me, Miss Hunter. I was talking to a friend of mine about you the other day. She's oh? a private school in Walsall. I believe she said she had an opening for you. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you're, you're a darling. Oh, no, my dear, it's quite inconsequential. Oh. Already, no, shut up, Watson. Oh. Well, Dr. Watson, you certainly had some exciting times when you were living with Sherlock Holmes. I certainly did, Mr. Manning. Those were the days. I mean, no, no but a dull moment. Yes, but I think of the thrilling experiences that, that Holmes brought into my life. I can almost forgive him for being so, so deucedly critical. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before Dr. Watson tells us what next week's adventure will be, here's what to do when you feel any sign of a cold. Here's what to do for prompt relief. Go right to your druggist and say a package of bromoquinine tablets, please. Start taking the tablets right away, according to the directions on every box. You'll be surprised with the prompt action of bromoquinine tablets. You'll be amazed with the way they relieve a cold's discomfort. You'll get results such as to delight and reassure you. You'll say, here indeed is a dependable preparation well worthy of its fame. Don't leave your radio tonight without making a mental note that any sign or suspicion of a cold, you're going to take bromoquinine tablets. You'll probably have more than one occasion to be grateful for the resolution. Remember, Bromo, B-R-O-M-O, quinine, Q-U-I-N-I-N-E, Bromo quinine cold tablet. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week, sir? Well, next week, we shall hear about a noble bachelor who finally married and whose, uh, whose wife disappeared between the wedding and the bridal breakfast. So this bachelor had a wife, eh? Even Holmes will have trouble explaining that. Not at all, Mr. Manning. Not at all. You'll hear all about it next week. And the most peculiar story it is, too. You have been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Copper Beaches, starring Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. The dramatization was by Edith Miser. This program is presented from Hollywood every week at this same time by the makers of Promo Quinine Cold Tablets. Quick relief for cold. This is not many speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. This is one case where the commercials are definitely helpful uh, as to establishing the age of the show. 
Now, the website I actually found this particular episode on, uh, because there were two productions of the Copper Beaches. Uh, this one, the, the site I downloaded this off of, dated this show as from 1943, so we wouldn't be showing it for a couple weeks. However, the ad told me the sponsor of the show was Bromoquanine. And uh, Bromoquanine was no longer the sponsor of the show in 1943. Petri Wine had taken over. So, uh, from that, we are able to deduce that this was actually the 1940 uh, broadcast of uh, the Copper Beaches from the 1940-41 season. So, I don't, I, I, I'm sure a deduction of which Holmes would be proud. All right. I love this uh, whole uh, tension between the sense of detective stories as being logical and there being this uh, emotion in there. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, particularly in the way that Rathbone portrays Holmes, there's this, um, you could almost say, a pretension of uh, detachment. However, for Holmes to be, uh, uh, in a, you know, if it were just a matter of logic and figuring it out, you know, Holmes would be like, well, I've already, I've, well, I've got to get there. It doesn't necess wouldn't necessarily matter to him whether he arrived. Uh, with the governess alive or dead. Um, instead, it's like, we've got to hurry. Um, again, there's there's some uh, definite concern, and that, you know, and so I, I think that, I think that, in, in one way, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating contrast, uh, because I think Holmes is almost, uh, almost seems somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat in denial about his own uh, emotional responses from the case to the cases um, and how it really um, engages him. I also love that part uh, where uh, he was discussing why he was why he was more afraid from for her in the uh, in the countryside than the, in the city. Uh, it's actually a, a you know um, statistically um, it's actually doesn't uh, doesn't hold water because you know they're generally in most small towns there's less chance of uh, something bad happening than in a, a large city. Uh, but I, I think that the view, uh, as expressed by Holmes here, really uh, really does govern a lot of uh, thoughts um, in Hollywood both then and now because you'll always hear this. This town where everything looks calm, but there's a dark, dark secret. Uh, and you, you see the, kind of the logic behind it, even if all the statistics aren't necessarily there to back it up. All right, well, that'll wrap it up for this week's show. Got any comments? Send them my way. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, and uh, please cast your vote for us at Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.